This episode is sponsored by The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, we're going to do another episode today on so-called false apostle, apostle, uh, Catherine Crick. This woman is not an apostle of Jesus Christ. God did not send her. She's not a prophetess. And we're going to prove that definitively here using one of the biblical tests. And so um, what we're going to be reviewing today is a message that she's released not once, but twice, because she wants the body of Christ to see it. So Catherine, I'm part of the body of Christ. I've seen it. We're going to test it the way scripture says to test it. And we're going to demonstrate that this is not a message from God and everybody needs to recognize you for what you are, a false prophetess. So, yeah, th there's your lead-in, by the way. <laughs> so, all of that being said, let me whirl up the desktop. And, um, yeah, warmer days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was in Huntington Beach. Uh, winter has arrived here in North Dakota, unfortunately, but uh, alas, that's not what we're here for. So let's do this. The message in question, like I said, she's released it twice over the past couple of weeks uh, because she really believes that people need to see it. So Sunday services at uh, Fivefold Church titled A Prophetic Word for the Body of Christ. So if you are a Christian, uh, you need to hear this. And this is a rebroadcast from October 29th. So she legitimately hasn't put this out once. She's put it out twice, and she thinks this is super de duper important, and you need to hear it. Well, we're going to do what Scripture says to do. And in Scripture, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. We're going to test Catherine Crick. So far, every test that we've applied to her, she has failed spectacularly. Uh, not, 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 it wasn't even close. I mean, there was like no doubt whatsoever she didn't pass any of the biblical tests. So one of the things we're going to be looking for is how she's handling biblical texts herself. If she is wrongly using them, and she will be, she is not a true prophet of God because there's a test in Deuteronomy 13 that applies to everybody claiming to be a prophet today. Plus, we'll throw in a little bit of 1 Corinthians 14 just for good measure, but we got some other texts we have to look at along the way. So here's the setup here, and I have to warn you ahead of time. Uh, this is a longer uh, uh, episode of Fighting for the Faith because we have a lot more ground that we need to cover. And I'm going to try not to interrupt as often as I do, but oftentimes when I lead off with that intention, I never really follow through with it. So just keep that in mind. So here's the setup. Listen to what she says here at the beginning of her message. So today I have a prophetic word for you all for the body of Christ. All right. So I'm not making this up. So back when she originally delivered this, she believed that she was delivering a prophetic word for who? Everybody in the body of Christ. And when you kind of hear what she's going to be doing in the setup or in the lead up before she gives that prophetic word, uh, you're going to, um, you, you might be creeped out. It's not only cringy, it's cultish. Best way I can put it. But let's listen a little bit more. Yes. This is a prophetic ministry, so there's no such thing as rigid, planned sermons, but it is led by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. One of the, um, the false teachings of the, uh, the general Pentecostal movement, that somehow God, the Holy Spirit, is offended and, and, and is driven off when you actually, you know, pre-plan a sermon. You have structure in your church service. So, you know, she's claiming that, uh, well... This is a prophetic church. There's no such thing as a rigid, planned sermon. But this church is led by the Holy Spirit. We give the Holy Spirit free reign. 
Yeah, that's a false doctrine within um, Pentecostalism. In fact, it's part of the original uh, false narrative behind the Azusa Street Revival. Uh, if you've read, ever read Frank Bartleman's book on Eyewitness to Azusa Street, he talks about the fact that he believed that the Holy Spirit flat out left, abandoned the Church of Christ uh, in, the, you know, in the early years after the apostles died because the church got organized. And the Holy Spirit is driven away by organization. Uh, and structure and things like that. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is a God of order, not of disorder. And I would note, already, you know, Catherine Crick has a big strike against her. So as, we're going to test what she's saying. And already she's failing the test. But another way that she's failing the test spectacularly is because of the prohibition in 1 Corinthians 14. And this is a command not from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not one of the original founding members of the He-Man Woman Haters Club. The Apostle Paul said this, As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but should, should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. It is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Note, it continues. Or are you the only ones it has reached? So if anyone thinks that he is a prophet, and Catherine Crick thinks that she is, or is spiritual, and she thinks that she is, then he, and in this particular case, she should acknowledge that the things that the Apostle Paul wrote, it, they are a command of the Lord. Yeah, she's breaking an outright command of Jesus Christ. It was Christ that commanded that women should be silent in the churches. And the fact that she's up there in a scarlet red dress doesn't really speak well to her, by the way. And she shouldn't be preaching at all, period. This is a church service. She's not permitted to do that there. So this is a command of the Lord. And if anyone does not recognize this, he, in her particular case, she should not be recognized, full stop. That's just how this works. So already we can tell by just by what she's doing, she's failing a test. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. She's one of them. We know this definitively now, because she can't be recognized. Scripture forbids us from recognizing her. This message already fails even before she delivers it. But if that's not enough, and you want to actually hear the content of her message, we'll, we'll slog on. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to just to where she's going to start to make some points. And this is where she's setting the foundation upon which she's going to deliver her so-called prophetic message. And this does this is not good. This is flat out creepy. We continue. Throughout the word of God, throughout the Bible, there have been several different moves of God. Revivals or just something that God is doing moves of God, that God is doing something specific here in this generation. And then later in this generation, God is doing something here, something significant for everyone, not just whoever wants to be a part, um, whoever is just there physically. It's for all of God's people, right? So we see this throughout the word of God, many different moves of God, revivals, uh, revival deliverance, such as the, the millions of Israelites that were delivered out of Egypt. That was a move of God. That was a revival. That was deliverance from death to life, from bondage to freedom. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, likening the Exodus to a revival, that is, that is spreading the Pentecostal butter really thinly. Um, that's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Which biblical text is she preaching from, by the way? She isn't. So note, by merely referencing the biblical text, not reading them out, she's now hijacking the narrative of Scripture. The Exodus itself is an incredible and important story. Uh, it is a story definitely of God's deliverance, but the reality is, is that it's a type and shadow of the deliverance that we have in Jesus Christ. If you were to summarize it, uh, when the story opens in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel, uh, they are under, they are slaved. They've been enslaved by an evil false god king known as Pharaoh who wears a snake hat, 
go figure. He's a stand-in for the devil. And God has then decided that he's going to make good on his promises and deliver them. And by mighty acts of judgment done through a, a prophet that God raised up, Moses, God delivers the people of Israel, baptizes them in the Red Sea, brings them to Mount Sinai, gives them his word and his law. And, uh, and, and so there's some important themes in there. And this then is, if you would, a roadmap for the story that we find ourselves in. When you were conceived and born, you were born dead in trespasses and sin under the dominion of darkness. Christ has destroyed the works of the devil by coming to earth, humbling himself, being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, dying and bleeding for your sin sins and mine, and then victoriously rising from the grave and ascending into heaven. All that being said, when you were baptized, you were set free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil, and now you are on your wilderness wandering as you head towards the real promised land, which is the new heaven and the new earth. You know, there's important themes there, but she's hijacking the story because she just wants to point out, well, in the past, God did mighty things, deliverance and revivals and thingies and stuff. And there, and God always chose important people for those things. Okay. We continue. That was a move of God in that generation, a specific move of God that God was doing in that generation. Um, and, you know, with each move of God that we see in the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament, The move of God is always having a leader, a leader of the move of God, because this is how God has chosen to do it. This is how he has chosen to move through vessels. We have to accept that. Amen. And you can already see where she's going. It's she's telegraphing her punch at this point. And I got to I got to say this. I've been doing you know, Christian apologetics for decades now. And it is, this kind of message is rare. This is the kind of message that isn't just from somebody who doesn't know how to rightly handle God's word. This is the kind of message that you hear from somebody like a Jim Jones and, or, you know, or or, or a cult leader, like a legitimate cult leader. Uh, you must accept me is kind of the sub line of all of this. And if you do not accept me, if you reject me, you are rejecting God himself. That's legitimately where she's heading. But we'll let her continue to spin this out. The Bible says, Matthew 10, 40, anyone who receives you receives me. Anyone who receives you receives me. So Jesus is saying this to the disciples. Anyone who receives you receives me. Powerful. Why? Because this is how God chooses to move through vessels. You- and here she's twisting an important text. So in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, uh, we have Jesus speaking to the men who would become his apostles. Remember, uh, the 12 then are no longer just disciples. They are apostles of Jesus Christ. They are sent as apostles of Jesus Christ. And with that being the case, they are apostles with extraordinary authority and power. And so Christ isn't saying here, well, anybody I send in the future or whatever is going to have that same power. He says to the apostles, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. This cannot be applied then today to Catherine Crick. This, this, this doesn't apply to her. Now, Christ goes on to say the one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's award or reward. But the apostles are not mere prophets. They are legitimately men who can give commands for Christ, which is one of the reasons why the apostle Paul is able to say, if you do not acknowledge that what I am saying to you is a command of the Lord, then you should not be acknowledged. The reason why Paul has the authority to say that is because he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so there's far more to the authority that the apostles had. Now, there's a a cross-reference to this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, specifically verse 16, if I am not mistaken. Um, Listen to what Christ, again, says to his apostles. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. The one who rejects me rejects him 
who sent me. This is talking about apostolic authority. And Catherine Crick, she is not a true apostle of Jesus Christ. And we know this with certainty because she's twisting God's word and disobeying clear commands of the Lord Jesus Christ given through the apostles that Christ actually chose. And so she comes to us claiming to be an apostle because Jer Davies said that she was. And Jer Davies is just, he's a flim flam scam artist artist and a word of faith heretic. So keep that in mind. We continue. You can't separate the move of God from God's vessels, from his servants leading the move of God. You cannot separate it. This is a principle that we have to accept. And so we see in the move of God of deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt, God sent Moses to lead this move of God. And Moses had to be accepted. <laughs> I'm sent by God to lead a move of God and I have to be accepted. That's what she is saying. And, and you have to she you have to accept her just because she says so, despite the fact she doesn't pass any of the tests at all. I would note something here. Um in, in this in this context, if I were to go to like Acts chapter, I don't know, maybe 17, um, yeah, notice what happens here, Acts chapter 17. So uh, Paul had some trouble in Thessalonica, you know, more than a little bit. He had to skedaddle, you know, in the middle of the night and, uh, you know, for his own safety, leave town. So it says this, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Hmm. You'll note the Apostle Paul doesn't play the uh, God's anointed card with them. It, literally, the Bereans, they are they are praised by God as having a more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they tested. They tested to see if the message that the Apostle Paul was bringing them actually comported with Scripture. And they tested the Apostle Paul in the process, because had they rejected the message the Apostle Paul had given, they would be rejecting him as well. And so they tested his message. Paul didn't breeze into town and sit there and go, well, listen, I'm the Apostle. I'm sent by God. You have to accept me and everything I say. No. Basically, he subjected himself to their biblical scrutiny. And you know who isn't doing that? This woman, right? We continue. They couldn't go rogue and get delivered their own way. They would have missed out on the deliverance and been stuck in Egypt. But the deliverance, but the deliverance movement would have continued. If you want the move of God, if you want to be part of the move of God, if you want revival, you also have to accept God's servants leading the revival. Leading the oh, you want to be part of the new move of God. You've got to accept God's servants. Of course, Catherine Crick being one of them. The move of God. Moses had to be accepted. The move of God that was happening in the time of Elijah was led by Elijah. The move of God happening in the time of Elisha, the miracles that were taking place, was led by Elisha. Moses, after he passed away, uh, Joshua received anointing from him, and he, jo Joshua went into the promised land. He led the people into the promised land. And so when Moses left, there needed to be a leader again. Joshua was there and led the people. So they got to enter the promised land. Yeah, they wouldn't have been able to enter the promised land if they didn't accept the leaders that God raised up. No biblical text actually makes that point, Catherine. This revival of promised land with this move of God, but they had to accept their leader. Amen. We see that Peter was leading the, the revival when Jesus died and was, was crucified and was resurrected. And then it was time for the good news to be spread and people to come into the kingdom. Peter was preaching and thousands came to Jesus that day. He, P Jesus says, Peter, you are my rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. I give you the keys to the kingdom. Okay, now here's where we're going to do a little bit of more nuanced biblical work here. Note here, in her portion leading up to the prophetic message, which she'll be giving shortly, she is claiming that Christ built the church on Peter, 
That's not what the biblical text says, and you have to know your biblical languages to actually figure this out. So let's take a look at what she's doing wrong, which, by the way, also proves that she fails the test here. So the the text in question is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. And this is where the Greek is super important. Otherwise, you end up in the same error as the as the Church of Rome, uh, which basically says that Peter is the rock that Christ built the church on. That is not what Christ was saying at all, and I'll prove it to you. So in Matthew 16, starting at 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, keep this in mind. This is Peter's confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, we're going to have to pay close attention to how the Greek works here. Otherwise, we're going to make the same error that Catherine Crick is making. So, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Jesus says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Petras. So, let me take a look at the, at the, uh, the Greek here. Okay, so here's what's going on. So Jesus says, but I say to you, de soy lego hati su, I say to you, e petras kai epitauta te petra oiko dome domeso. Okay, uh, sorry, I have to throw in the move. Oiko domeso su te neklesian. So this is an important phrase, and we have to pay attention to the genders, because the genders of the Greek words tell us what Jesus is referencing. What is he referring to? So he says to him, I say to you that you are Petras, you are Peter, masculine ending. You are Petras, kai epitauta te Petra, upon this rock feminine, Okay, so epi, uh, kai epi tauta te petra oiko de so, uh, oik a de meso mu ke ecclesian. Upon this petra, this feminine rock, I will build my church. Okay, so here's your problem. If you say that, that Christ built the church on Peter, Jesus changes his gender. You are petras, and on this petra, I will build my church. That doesn't work. So Peter, Petras, is not the one that the church is built on. The church is built on Tain Petra, upon the rock. What's the rock? It's feminine. It's not masculine, so it can't be Peter, unless, of course, Jesus is, is, is into the trans movement and he just changed Peter's pronouns and turned him into a girl. It doesn't work, right? So what is the Petra, the feminine rock? Answer, it's Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. This is what Christ builds his church on. Not Peter, but Peter's confession. And the fact that Catherine Crick here has twisted this text is, is, is it's a monumental blunder on her part and shows again that she is not a true prophetess. She is twisting the word. She has just twisted it the same way the Roman Catholic Church twisted, twisted and you can't do it when you know how the Greek works. So now we've got a big problem. And that is, is that she's failing one of the major tests of a prophet. Already she's failed it by disobeying a command of Christ. And scripture says we can't even recognize her. But there's another, there's another test for a prophet. It's found in Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. 
but the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which Yahweh, your God, commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. This is an important test because this is the theological test. And even if somebody tells a prophecy, I prophesy so-and-so is going to win the 2024 election, and they turn, and it turns out to be true, they still are not considered a true prophet according to God's word because now you have to look at their doctrine, at their theology, and you're going to note it begins with let us go after other gods, but that's not the entirety of the test because the entirety of the test requires you to test whether or not they are going to have you walk after the Lord our God in keeping his commandments and obeying his voice in the scriptures. And so when somebody comes to you claiming to be a prophet and they're twisting the biblical texts, they are disobeying this command and they fail this test then of a prophet. So Catherine Crick has disobeyed the voice and command of Christ regarding women in the church, and now she's twisting God's word. And although her twists so far are subtle, they are twists nonetheless, and we must not listen to her because we have a clear command of God that when someone doesn't pass the theological test, that we are to obey God's voice in the scripture, not the one coming to us claiming to be a prophet, even if they give a prophecy that comes true. So we're you know this this is looking pretty bad already and we haven't even gotten to the prophecy yet. Peter had to be accepted. All these miracles were happening as people. Now I'm going to back this up so you can hear her what she said in this case where she basically makes Peter the rock rather than Peter's confession. Shows she hasn't studied and showed herself approved. She doesn't understand what's going on in that passage. Jesus says, "Peter, you are my rock, and on this rock I will build my church. I give you the keys to the kingdom." Peter had to be accepted. All these miracles were happening as people... No, that, Peter's not the rock. Peter is... It's his confession that's the rock, the Petra. ...came under the shadow of Apostle Peter. If you want to receive the miracles, you have to do it God's way. You have to accept God's leader. And then the miracles... You have to accept God's leader. Again, this is Jim Jones' level of cult kind of talk. ...will happen. You will experience revival. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then as time went on, Paul became a leader. You had to accept Paul. Yet the Bereans didn't accept him. They tested him before they accepted him. They tested his message against the word of God before they accepted him or his message. Weird, huh? To receive what God was doing in that time. Amen? Hallelujah. So this is God's principle. Um, we, get, we don't get to choose who the servant of God that will lead the move of God will be. We don't get, it's not up to us, that's up to God. God can choose whoever he wants, young, old, went to Bible school or not, male or female, connected or. God is never going to choose a female who preaches on Sunday because that female is disobeying a clear command of Christ. Or nobody, popular or not, he can choose anyone he wants. Someone with a stutter, or not, or someone that's a really amazing speaker, naturally. He can choose whoever he wants, amen? We have to accept. So if we don't accept, we're not accepting God, actually, because this is how God wants to move. If you don't accept Catherine Crick, you're not accepting God. That's the subtext of this message. So it's a big deal to not accept God's servants who's leading his move. It's something we need to have the fear of God Four, amen. It's really, I mean, God has not changed. His principles have not changed. So it's really just as severe as rejecting Moses and Moses' time, rejecting a lie. You reject Catherine Crick, it's as severe as rejecting Moses or Elijah or even Jesus himself. Elijah and Elijah's time, rejecting Elisha and Elisha's time, rejecting Joshua and Joshua's time, rejecting Peter and Peter's time, rejecting Paul and Paul's time, rejecting Jesus in Jesus' time. So to reject Catherine Crick is to reject Christ himself. 
me show you another way in which she fails. There's a video, we're gonna put a link to, to it down below. If you haven't already seen this video, you need to see it. It's put out by my good friend, Daniel Long, and his YouTube channel, Long for Truth number one. Yeah, Long for Truth one. And we'll, like I said, we'll put a link to it down below. And the video in question, I'm very happy that he put this out because I didn't have the time to actually react to this. Uh, it was a, a mutual friend of ours, Daniel Chapman, who turned us on to a TikTok video uh, where this was uh, was being exposed, and uh, and Dan Long actually, you know, he had the time. I was traveling and I wasn't able to get it out, but he, he he hunted down the original video source, and and critiques it. And this is awful. I mean, talk about making merchandise of people and teaching them, and basically, uh, you know, basically exploiting people in greed. That's exactly what Catherine Crick does here. So let me set this up for you. In this video, we have a small child apparently manifesting a demon. I have to wonder how much they paid the child to do this. You know, is he one of these crisis actors that we've, uh, other people and myself have proven that Catherine Crick's ministry has made use of? But watch what happens while this cat child is manifesting. She's going to have a conversation with the woman and consider then what is going to be required of this woman before her child can be delivered of this demon. Watch this. Enough of your nonsense. What is owed? Speak now. Thank you, Jesus. God is going to free him completely. There are different keys to receive complete freedom. And what happens is the more that we entangle ourselves with, with witchcraft and psychics and things like that, it's like a more complex deliverance. So sometimes it's not just about the commanding the demons, but there's other keys that need to be unlocked. And one of them is to sow seeds. Did you pay money to the psychic? Yes. How much? So in order for this woman's child to be delivered from a demon, she has to basically pay Catherine Crick for the deliverance. That's what sow a seed means. It's, it's give my ministry money. Who knows? Hundreds. Ongoing for years, because I didn't know, but I've been following you for six years. So it's ongoing for years. So in the spiritual realm, there's laws. I've been, I've been so 10% of everything that comes through my hands for the last two years. 10%. God's saying more. Okay. Because <laughs> more than 10%. You gotta, God's saying more. You gotta give me more. You gotta pay me money before this child can be delivered. I cannot think of a more disgusting thing that I've ever heard in my life. I can't recall a single time when somebody came to Jesus or brought somebody to Jesus who was demonized and Jesus said, nope, can't do anything until you pay money for that particular deliverance. It, this is just blasphemy beyond the pale. 10% is with what's, what, what's God. So now we need to sow specifically for his deliverance. You gotta pay me so that he can be delivered. And speak, this is for his deliverance. This is sick. I mean, this is just absolutely sick. So we continue uh, with this message that she's been giving. Rejecting Paul is, reject, is rejecting Jesus. Rejecting God's leaders of the revival today, that's rejecting Jesus, you know. That's what she's saying. Again, this is cult leader levels of delusion. It's the same. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is still moving today. God is still bringing just as big moves of God and even greater because we're going glory to glory today as he did back then. Amen. So what we also find throughout the word of God is that there were constantly people who did not want to accept the servants of God who led God's move. Catherine. Are you aware that God commands us in his word to test those people claiming to be servants of God and prophets of God and apostles of God, and you fail every single one of those tests personally? And we see not just anyone not accepting the leaders, but we see the, the servants of God that God chose, but we see leaders in that time, people of influence in that time, people with power in their time rejecting the servant of God who is leading God's move to try to stop God's move, which can never be done, but they try. So we're going to take a look at some examples in the word of God. 
And so uh, Joseph, Joseph, he was not accepted by his brothers. He received a dream from God. He received this dream, this vision, this promise from God. And so this was God saying, I'm choosing you in my move. He chose Joseph to rescue and save the people in that time because there was a severe famine coming. Notice what she's not doing. She ain't reading the biblical text. This is her summary of it and a highly inaccurate summary at that. Let's take a look at the text in question, shall we? Genesis 37, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And then it goes on to say, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then he dreamed another dream. And he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So here's the thing. How this is going to be fulfilled is still way down the line. Um, And if you've read the story, you know it. But at the time that Joseph had the dreams, it, it was clear that they were heading in a particular direction. But what was going to be taking place is that that was not it at all. And it was not as if God was saying, so therefore I'm expecting you guys because I've chosen Joseph to be the head of my, uh, of the latest revival. And so you have to accept him. That's never part of the story at all. So what Catherine is doing here in summarizing it rather than preaching it and teaching it properly, uh, she's basically hijacking this text to make it a proof text for you've got to accept me as God's apostle and prophet. And God gave him, God gave, God ended up when the promise is fulfilled, he gave Joseph supernatural wisdom, supernatural wisdom and insight of how to deal with these issues that were happening with the famine. He gave him this wisdom to store away grain, store away food, to save some, that all the people would would save some. Here's the thing, Catherine. Even Joseph didn't know there was a famine coming at that time. His brothers didn't know anything about a famine coming at that time. You're taking the latter part of the story and smooshing it into the first part in order to make your point. And that... When the famine came, there would be food that, that then they could come and receive that food and they distribute it out. Otherwise, people would have died like crazy. But God came in this move to save his people. And God chose Joseph to lead this move. He didn't leave a, lead a move. He led Egypt, the country. So when Joseph gets this, this, dream, this word from God... He tells his brothers, and his brothers instantly became jealous. And, and, and their jealousy made them want to stop God's promise from coming to pass in Joseph's life. No, they just hated their brother. What are you talking about? So again, no, she miserably fails uh, the Deuteronomy 13 test regarding sound theology. She's not a true prophet or apostle at all. She's twisting God's word the way the devil does. So they tried, they literally tried to stop it by putting Joseph in a prison, or sorry, in a pit to die. And then they ended up bringing him out and and selling him to. So note how she's reading herself into the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is about Jesus Christ. Uh, Yeah. 
In fact, let me let me show you this because it's it's really wonderful when you understand where the Bible is legitimately pointing. In the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in in chapter one, it says this: the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. There's the name Joseph again. Notice the name of the of the of the not the biological father, but the earthly father of Christ. Uh, to you know, when Mary was betrothed. To Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Oh, look, a Joseph who is having dreams. Yeah, do not do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Je- Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Uh, the, the next part of this is also super important. After the visit of the Magi, uh, you know, so uh, you, know, you got the story of the, of the, visit, of the uh, visit of the Magi in the opening portion of chapter two, and it says this in starting in verse 13, now when they had, the Magi had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed Egypt, uh, departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was the Lord spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I've called my son. So here we've got a Joseph with dreams who ends up in Egypt, but this time with the Messiah. All right. That's really what's going on in the story of Joseph. This points us to Jesus. But who is she making this story about now? Catherine Crick is making it about herself. Mm -hmm. Slave owners. And the slave owners then brought him to Egypt. And the story is so beautiful because it shows how people will try to stop, influential people, your brothers in Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ who are the ones that are supposed to be the most supportive of you and love God the most. So therefore, accept what God is doing and doing through you they may try to stop what God is doing in you. Stop. Listen, anybody speaking against Catherine Crick is doing so because they know their Bible. Anyone who believes this woman's an actual prophetess or an apostle of Jesus Christ doesn't know the scripture and doesn't know that they're required by God to test this woman. And she fails every test. The move of God that's happening in you, but they can never stop. Whatever, (laughs) hallelujah, whatever, they meant for harm. They meant to stop the work of God, but it actually made this move of God happen, be fulfilled, promise be fulfilled. Because by selling him to the slave owners, that positioned Joseph into the place where the king would accept him. And the king accepting him led to the promise being fulfilled. God's move of saving the people, rescuing the people to take place, to happen. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Now, let me fast forward. We're really close to this, and then at this point, to where she's going to give the so-called prophecy, at least deliver, we're going to listen to a, a portion of it, and you can tell right off the bat it's false. But before we get to that, here is where our, our sponsor today comes into play. Today's sponsor for Fighting for the Faith is a wonderful podcast. The name of the podcast is The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. If you you need a resource to hear God's word rightly exegeted, pointing us to Jesus Christ. This is the podcast. It is a daily podcast and it is chock full of God's word. And here's the best bit. The archives are extensive and they're getting larger. Currently, Pastor Will Whedon is on the book of Genesis chapters five through 11. He's already taught through chapters one through four. He's now doing a series on chapters five through 
to 11, and they're brilliant. This is going to include the flood of Noah and how that then points us to Christ, who is our ark. And so, listen, you you need this. If you do not rightly understand God's word, you want a crash course on learning proper exegesis and how everything connects to Jesus, this is your podcast. And stop listening to yahoos like Catherine Crick and others, and instead avail yourselves of sound biblical exegetes who understand that the Bible is about Jesus. This podcast is spectacular, and you will not go wrong in listening to this podcast. You will not be led astray into false prophecies and false apostles and nonsense like that. Instead, everything's going to exalt and glorify and point us to Jesus. It's a wonderful podcast. Again, if you would like to learn about this, go to thewordendures.org. Thewordendures.org. We'll put a link down below in the description so that you can put this podcast on your list of podcasts that you listen to. You will benefit greatly from it. All right, moving on. So now we're about to hear, she's going to be setting up the the last bits of her message in preparation for delivering the prophetic word that is for the entire body of Christ. And she's failed so many tests at this point, we already know this prophecy is false. She's false. But let's continue, because she's got some more Bible twisting that she still has left in her bag. He had that, and Saul forgot that. Saul forgets and thinks he's... So Saul forgot that David was a leader that God chose, and Saul needed to, needed to embrace and, and recognize that, uh, that David was God's chosen. Just messing around with a normal person who's trying to be king or something. No, this was God's anointed that must be king, must be anointed king for God's plans to go forth. Now... If you were to go backwards into this message, this is just a complete train wreck because she's basically saying the reason why Saul had his demise is because Saul failed to recognize that David was God's anointed, which ignores an entire theme in scripture. So let's do this. We're going to go to here and we're going to look for the word cave. Okay. And we're going to look it specifically for an instance of a cave about the time of King David. Okay. Let's see here. David persuaded his men who did not permit them to attack Saul. First Samuel 24. Okay. First Samuel 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. You'll note this is the portion of scripture where Saul is legitimately trying to murder King David, the anointed but not yet, uh, not yet coronated king of Israel. And here's what's happening. Saul wants him dead. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. He went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats, rocks, and he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. Yeah, that's right. Saul's using the cave for the purpose of using it as a latrine. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost part of the cave. So there's Saul reading the Jerusalem Times and in quite a vulnerable situation. He doesn't even know his, his, his life is in danger. And David is there. His men see it's like, ah, we could kill King Saul. So the men of David said to him, here is the day of which Yahweh said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. So then David rose stealthily, cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, Yahweh's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is Yahweh's anointed. So what Catherine Crick is doing here is completely flipping the script. The reason why Saul had the kingdom ripped out of his hands was not because he was disobedient to the commands of God, but because he failed to recognize that David was God's anointed. But David refused to kill Saul because he recognized that he was the rightly anointed king of Israel and far be it from him from taking the life of the rightly anointed king of Israel. Interesting, right? Yeah, Catherine Crick here has completely turned the story of David and Saul on its end. So once again, he forgets that he's fighting against God. And today, today, servants of God have been called by God. They have received 
prophetic words from God. So and of course, she's one of them. In Peter 1 verse 19, we also have... Okay, now I'm going to back this up. I want you to hear this in context, and we're going to take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, because this is a huge twisting of God's word, not a small one, huge. Let me back this up. Here we go. And today, today, servants of God have been called by God. They have received prophetic words from God. 2 Peter 1 verse 19, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. The true prophetic word from a true prophet of God is completely reliable. Now, it's hard to see what she did there because she ripped a portion of 2 Peter out of context. But let me tell you this, 2 Peter, Peter here in his last epistle before he's about to be crucified, he is not pointing us to more prophets. Instead, he's pointing us to the written word of God. Let's take a look at it. 2 Peter chapter 1. So 2 Peter chapter 1. And here's where we need to let the context just dictate what's going on. So Peter says in first, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter is making reference to what's called the Mount of Transfiguration, where Christ was legitimately transformed in front of their eyes, and he was as bright, as white, as, it, as, as like lightning. Moses and Elijah showed up. They were discussing Christ. Christ's exodus, read the Gospel of Luke accounts in the Greek of the, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, it says they were discussing Christ's exodus. And of course, Peter, uh, you know, kind of speaking up and maybe a little bit out of turn says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Should we make a shelter for you and for Moses and Elijah? And then the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, is what the voice said right? So he's referencing that experience, but watch where Peter goes from here, because he's not saying we need to chase after those kinds of experiences. Instead, he says something very different. And we, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter isn't pointing us to modern day prophets. He's pointing us to the scripture, the thing that we're supposed to be paying attention to, the prophetic word of God found in the Bible. That's what Peter is saying here. Pay attention to the word. So what Catherine Crick has done here is hijacked this text, taken a portion out of it, a portion of it out of context and completely misappropriated it by applying it to herself. So, so again, watch what she does here. Now that you know what it says, listen again. Prophetic words from God. 2 Peter 1 verse 19. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. The true prophetic word from a true prophet of God is completely reliable. Peter's pointing us to the scriptures, not to you. Again, watch the text, okay? Um, knowing, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from, own, from someone's own interpretation. So here's the words she read. We have the word, prophetic word of God more fully confirmed or reliable. And she just stops after reading that much and ignores, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the storm, morning star rises in your heart, knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Peter's pointing us to the scripture, not to Catherine Crick, and Catherine Crick just avoids the part that doesn't jive with her false theology and the message she claims that she's bringing from God. And she makes this text where Peter then is pointing to her rather than to the Bible. And that's a complete abomination. We continue. No question about it. And you will do well to pay attention to it. 
As to a light shining in a dark place. And to uh, pay attention to what, Catherine? Peter says the scripture. Let's see if that comes out of her face. It probably will, but she's totally twisted this up at this point to make it about her. So the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And I relate with this. I too have a prophetic word from my spiritual father, prophet, Dr. Jor Davy. <sighs> Jor Davies is a heretic. I never wanted to be an apostle. You're not. Congratulations. If you never wanted to be one, you still aren't. I never wanted to be a minister. I never wanted to. You're not. Be a pastor of a church. You're not. I never wanted to preach. You shouldn't be at all. I never desired to be a praying for people. Never did I desire that or want that. I did not call myself. I did not choose myself. God did not call you. You fail every test of a true apostle and prophet. This is not my venture, but this is all God's. I surrendered to God um, about exactly eight years ago, surrendered everything to God, including my plans, dreams, and will. And I was positioning myself at that point of surrender to go wherever God wanted me to go and be whoever God wanted me to be. You are not doing anything that God has called anybody to do. And do whatever he wanted me to do. And so about nine months after I surrendered everything, I chose to seek God, keep seeking him, keep seeking him. And so there was an invitation to a conference, a prophetic healing conference in L.A. And with hunger of God and feeling God pulling me to go, I went. And it was there that I met my spiritual father for the first time, where I saw him minister for the first time, and where he prophesied to me. That's where I received my calling. And upon receiving it, my feelings didn't want it. It was just obedience. It was just my obedience that led me here to where I am now. Amen. And so... Um, yeah, it's your obedience to a false teacher that has made you a disobedient to the clear words of Christ found in the scripture. It's, it's powerful when you don't call yourself somewhere where you're not like, I must have this, I want this. Because when the storms come, you, your, your feathers can get real ruffled. You, your emotions can take over you, you know, if, if you're obsessing so much over something you want. But if you're just obeying God and just doing what he wants. You're disobeying God by twisting up the scriptures and preaching in church, which you're not permitted to do. Then when the storms come, you stand firm, you stand strong. You don't let your emotions take over because you know that it's God who called you here. You, don't, you didn't want to be here, but it's God who has placed you here, and God will see you through. God will make the promises come to pass. God will. So you just got to take her word for it. This is all God, despite the fact that she fails every biblical test, every single one of them. All right, let's get to the part where she releases the, uh, the, the prophecy. Here we go. Hallelujah. Hang on a second. I think I got this a little too fast. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll slow it down just a little bit. There we go. So now I'm going to, to share this prophetic word that God has for the body of Christ. And we already know it's a false prophecy. Already know because she fails all the tests. And has for leaders in the body of Christ. So the prophecy for leaders, I guess that would apply to me as well as all pastors. Okay. It is not okay to just sit comfortably in your churches, sitting comfortably and not supporting what God is doing now. Mm. How dare you sit comfortably in your church and not support Catherine Crick? Not saying anything, not saying even hallelujah for a new move that God has brought. This is not okay. This is not God's move. God is asking you to say something. I am. I'm warning the body of Christ like scripture tells me to do so that people will mark and avoid you and not be swept up into your new cult. To stand with God. To not fight God anymore. If you oppose Catherine Crick, you are fighting God. To not try to stop his move anymore. Like a ceiling that has been put over the move of God. Trying to stifle the move of God. This move of God is going to reach the entire world. It's not a move of God. 
It's going to every corner of the world. It's going to every platform. It's going to break through every barriers. This move of God is not optional for the body of Christ. It's not optional. You either join or you're opposing God. I repeat, this move of God is not optional for the body of Christ. When, the, when it was time for God to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt and then go into the promised land, God wasn't asking them if they wanted to come. He was commanding them and calling them, come. So you got to join Catherine Crick. God's commanding you to. All of you. This revival is not just for some denominations. This move of God is not just for those who like revival and woo, revivals now, we like to say this. No, this is the end time revival. No, it's not. For the entire body of Christ. And so just as it was an, a move of God for all of God's people in the times of Moses, just as it was a move of God for all of God's people in the Acts church, it is a move of God for all of God's people now. All of God's people. It is not optional. And you cannot ignore what God is speaking. You cannot ignore. It's clear when you apply the biblical test that the Holy Spirit put into the Bible, God is not speaking through you, Catherine. Or what God is doing. You cannot sit by comfortably and ignore it. We are to mark and avoid you. God will do what he wants to do with or without you. But he's asking you and more than that, commanding you to come and be a part. No way. No way. This is not from God. To acknowledge, accept, support, be a part. Why would God want me to acknowledge, accept, and support a woman who fails every biblical test of a true prophet and apostle? God makes it clear he wants us to avoid people like you and not listen to you. To, this, this word is for all leaders in the body of Christ. I, again, this applies to all pastors, and that would include me. Leaders in the body of Christ in America and leaders in the body of Christ across the world. And this word is very seriously for the older generation leaders in the body of Christ. So if you have gray hair like I do, uh-huh. Yeah, this, this, is, this is a prophetic word from God for guys like me. There's a principle of life and a principle in the kingdom that of, of passing the baton. So are you saying that every older pastor needs to abdicate their, their, their pastoral office and turn their congregations over to you? Really? God wants the older generation leaders in the body of Christ to pass the baton to the new generation. Yeah, uh-huh, her. No, honey, that ain't happening. It's not acceptable to stay quiet and hold on to the baton and keep going with the baton when God is saying, I'm calling you to pass it now. And what does that look like exactly? How does somebody like me pass a baton to you? Huh? How, how does that happen? How does that happen for a pastor who's pastoring a, a congregation in Albuquerque or pastoring a, a congregation in New York or pastoring congregations in Minnesota? How does somebody pass the baton to you so that they can obey the voice of Christ? This is nonsense. God has called you. God had called you. He gave you a word. He called you. He gave you a word. He gave you a prophetic word. He called you. I'm not a prophet. I have a prophetic word. It's called the Bible, and I'm supposed to preach that. And he gave you the baton when you were younger. But God is still speaking today. Yeah, he speaks through his word for sure. God, but he ain't speaking through you, lady. God didn't end with you. God is still speaking today. God is... is so no, this is the prophetic word portion of her, of the, her message. God is... Just as he spoke to you, those in the older generation when you were younger... He's speaking to the new generation now. He's calling Davids of today and speaking to them his word as he spoke to you when you were younger. 
and you need to pass the baton now. Okay, so if you're older, you got to get get out of ministry and hand your congregations over to her. And a lot of people in the body of Christ, a lot of leaders, a lot of older leaders, they think that God, they're doing all that God wants to do in themselves. And I don't know anybody who thinks that. You're just making that up. That's not from God. In their churches, in their church, alone. And that if God wants to do anything else, they will do it through them. Who are you talking about? They are the ones up top. You know, pride enters. A, a pastor is a servant of a congregation, not the head of it. Or they will do it for, in someone in their church, but they don't think that God may want to use someone else outside of your church, outside of your stream. None of this is lucid. This is not from God. But this is what God is doing. Jesus did not only call his own personal family, you're going to be my disciples. He didn't call just the people he grew up in, grew up in the temple with, you're going to be my disciples. He called fishermen, tax collectors, people outside his bloodline, people outside his stream. In the physical realm, when you, if you um, procreate, have children with people inside your family, the generation that comes next will be weak, maybe have deformities, they're going to be weak. Uh, inbreeding. And so biologically, we procreate, we have children outside of our bloodstream, and it scientifically makes stronger children, a stronger generation. So in the same way in the spiritual realm, God needs to go outside of the bloodstream. So people need to stop thinking that God can only use you or people in your church. God is using people outside. What is she saying? Uh, hey, listen, lady, I ain't spiritually procreating with you. No way. <sighs> we, we are a body of Christ, a body with different parts, and we can't be fighting with each other. Actually, we are to fight against you because you are not a true prophet. You fail all the biblical tests. We can't be fighting with each other. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 21. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't. Another twisting of scripture. You haven't proven that you're actually part of the body of Christ. Because you fail all the tests of a true prophet, you stand outside of the body of Christ, Catherine. Say to the feet, I don't need you. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And, one, if, and if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. And so... We need to realize that we are one body. We have to be united when we fight against each other. I cannot unite with you. Each, when we fight against each other, when we fight with silence, it, it's like this. It's like if, if, you're, if you're a leader today in the body of Christ and you are a, a hand and someone who God is raising up now is the stomach. The stomach is hungry. The stomach is very hungry. And the brain is God. And the brain is saying to the hand, pick up food and put it in the mouth so it can hit the stomach. But the hand is silent and ignores. And then the stomach never gets fed. And then the hand will be weak. You're totally twisting the biblical text again. Or death can happen. And when one part suffers, all will suffer. And that's the reality in the body of Christ today. We have the same God. Your God is the same as my God. We serve the same God. Why are we fighting against each other? Because you're a false prophet and a false apostle. It's only hurting yourself to fight against God. It's hurting the body to fight against God. It's keeping people from receiving. We aren't fighting against God. You are by disobeying his commands. In God's move, as you put the ceiling overhead of God's move. And so now here come the threat's going to be taken to a whole other level. Hang on for this. God is speaking this now to 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 the older generation leaders in the body of Christ. It's time to pass the baton. God has been speaking this for years now. He's been speaking this for years and time is soon running out. It's running out. If you're an older leader in the body of Christ like I am, you got to pass the baton to uh, to Catherine Crick because time is running out. God does not wait forever. If you do not hand the baton to the next generation, God will come and take it by force. 
Wow. So pass the baton over to Catherine Crick, all you pastors out there that are over a certain age and you're part of the older generation. Otherwise, God's going to come and take your baton by force and then still give it to Catherine Crick. Baloney. Saul was fighting against David and God gave him time to repent. God gave him time to pass the baton that God was asking him to. God never asked Saul to pass the baton. What are you talking about? Which biblical text says that? Because Saul, Saul's time was, had passed, and now it was David's time. And Saul knew this. But Saul was supposed to welcome David. Even if he was like, oh, I'm sad that I disobeyed God. He was still supposed to pass the baton and say, you are anointed now. I support. Totally hijacking this, this story of Saul and David. For you, we have the same God. When you succeed, I succeed. But he did not do that, what God was asking him to. And he fought David, he tried to stop it from happening and God gave him time. He gave him time to repent. That's why the fighting was happening for a while. It wasn't like he tried- Which biblical text says that? Fighting one day and that was it, God gave him time. God gave him time. But eventually the time was up. God allowed the Philistines to come to this point where they were about to kill Saul. And Saul decides he doesn't want to be killed by them. He'd rather just kill himself. So the Bible says that he fell on his own sword. But God allowing that death to happen was God. So all of that is, is a warning to you pastors out there that if you don't pass the baton to Catherine Crick right now, God's going to have you fall on your sword. God taking by force what Saul was not releasing to the next generation for God's move, new move, to prevail. Yeah. Do I need to go on? I don't think I do. This woman's a cult leader. This, there's more here than just an erring, bumbling person who doesn't know the Bible. This, this woman is teaching doctrines of demons. She fails every biblical test, every single one of them for a true prophet. She fails every test regarding somebody who can rightly handle God's word. She disobeys clear commands of Christ, and she is notably a masterful twister of God's word. The voice that you heard was not the voice of God. That was the voice of the devil. And threatening, if you don't hand over your church to her and the upcoming generation of the people who are supposed to be leading this whatever revival, then God's going to rip your, your pastoral uh, office away from you and give it to her anyway nonsense. You, if you, if you are a pastor, you must, by the command of Christ found in the scriptures, oppose this woman and under no circumstance, give her any quarter, any credibility at all. You must speak against her. She is a wolf that is doing great damage in the visible church right now. So if you found this helpful, all the information on how you can see, how you can share the video is down below. Please share it. People need to be warned about this woman. She's very, very dangerous. And a quick shout out. Thank you for all of you who support Fighting for the Faith financially. And you've joined our crew. Without your financial support, we could not be doing what we're doing here. And it's important for us to keep continue this work. So you make it possible for us to continue to bring Fighting for the Faith to you and the world. And I want to thank you. If you'd like to join our crew, there's a link down below that'll take us take you to our website where you can join our crew. And if you do, again, thank you. We can't do what we're doing without your support. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen.